Law 578, Law of Evidence 2, Lecture 1 on Witnesses, Competency, Compatibility and Privilege. Now in this lecture, we are going to look at issues relating to competency, compatibility and privilege and we are going to focus on different kinds of witnesses where issues of competency, compatibility and privilege is actually very important. We are looking at a spouse as a witness. We are going to look at accused person giving evidence in his own behalf. We are going to look at documents relating to affairs of states, witnesses relating to official communication and witnesses in professional communication. All right. Now, when we talk about a witness in the court, we always have, a, have to ask a question whether a person competent to testify in the court. Now, when we talk about competency to testify, you are basically asking a question, can a person testify in the court? Does he have the ability to testify in the court or whether he has the capacity to testify in the court? Issues of competency of a witness is actually provided for under section 118 to 122 of the Evidence Act 1950. And when a person is competent to testify in the court, the second issue will be, can he be compelled to testify in the court? So compatibility here is referring to a person may be competent to testify in the court, has the ability and capacity to testify in the court. However, can I force you to testify in the court? Right? So a person may be competent to testify in the court. He may not be compatible to testify in the court. Meaning to say that the law may be protecting him from giving evidence in the court. Right? So that is issues of compatibility. And we are going to look at this one when we discuss section 120, reading it together with section 122. And the third issue relating to this matter is with regards to privilege. Privilege here is concerned with if a person is competent to testify and can be forced to testify in the court, meaning that he is compatible to give evidence in the court, will there be protection given by law to this particular witness giving evidence in the court? Because what happened here is that a person can be competent to testify in the court, can be compatible to give evidence in the court. He may, however, refuse to testify in the court and not subject to contempt of the court if he can claim privilege. So privilege is a situation where a witness who is compatible to give evidence in the court but it is legally excused from giving evidence in the court or producing evidence in the court. So you regard that person to be a privileged person. So he is privileged to give evidence in the court. The protection is basically provided for by the law. And issues relating to privilege here is actually under section 121 to 132 of the Evidence Act 1950. Now let's look at issues of competency. Right? Under section 118, now let's read section 118. Section 118, who may testify? All persons shall be competent to testify unless the court considers that they are prevented from understanding the questions put to them or from giving rational answers to those questions by tender years, extreme old age, disease, whether of body or mind, or any other cause of the same kind. Now, this particular provision here basically says that anyone can testify in the court. It doesn't matter who you are, you are basically competent to testify in the court, meaning to say that you can be a witness in the court. There are only two situations where you cannot give evidence in the court or it means that you cannot give an unsworn evidence in the court if, number one, you don't understand the questions put to you or number two, you cannot give rational answers to those questions. And this can, be, can happen because of you are basically a person of tender years, you are so young or extremely old age or you have defective intellectual, yeah? Maybe by virtue of having disease of body of the mind. So this may affect the competency of a person to testify. 
Now, the case to illustrate to you whether a person is competent to testify in the court, you have the case of Tajuddin bin uh, Saleh. You also have the case of Sidiq bin Dudan, whereby in determining issues of competency of the child, you have to basically ask two questions. Does the witness here able to understand the questions put to them? And number two, whether the witness here able to give rational answers to those questions. Now, determination of competency of a witness here, if it becomes an issue, is basically mandatory. A magistrate has to, have, has to conduct a preliminary examination in determining the competency of a child. And failure to determine competency of the child, of the witness in particular, in preliminary examination may lead to miscarriage of justice because this failure cannot be curable under section 422 of the criminal procedure code. Now let's look at the case of Sidiq bin Ludan. Yeah? I think this case can illustrate to you important issues relating to competency. Of course, this case gives you examples of witness, a child witness giving evidence in the court. So just now we look at competency. When we talk about competency, you are basically having to comply with section 118 of the Evidence Act. A person has to be, uh, a person has to be competent to testify in the court. Basically, you have to ask the question whether you understand whether you understand the questions put to you and number two is that whether you are able to give to give rational answers to those questions right now when you talk about person able to give rational answers to those questions because basically when you talk about a child witness we are going to look into child witness later right so you have to ask this question because a child here have a special uh, law relating to giving evidence in the court because there is a presumption under the law is that the child tend to fantasize. Yeah, the child cannot give rational answers, they tend to fantasize because of their young age. Therefore, you have to be very careful when dealing with evidence of a child witness. Now let's look at what happened in the case of Tajuddin, right? Uh, uh, or you can even have a look at the case of Sidiq bin Ludan, right? The case of Sidiq bin Ludan basically talk about, okay, this person here who is uh, quite elderly, about 50 years old. So this person here basically likes this girl. So you have one witness here who is a nine-year-old girl, right? Right, and... This girl here, the okay, he she has another friends. You have F F and T. So you have two persons. So you have the girl here, who has a sister named F, who is ten year old, and another friend who is ten year old. So what they do is that they like to play, and the accused person tend to like these children very much. And he liked G most. So what happened is that one day he decided to bring G to play with her and basically gave some money to F and T for them to leave them alone. So he brought G to his hut at a rubber plantation where he raped her. Right? So she was raped. Remember this case happens quite a long while ago. So this is a very innocent girl who don't know what does it mean by rape, who doesn't know what does it mean by rape. So basically, she has been raped in the hut. Right? And she was asked by the accused person here not to tell anyone relating to what happened to her. And then he may have given her some money and she kept quiet. All right? Two days later, the same incident happened. And maybe a week later, the same incident happened. And the friends here was curious. Yeah, the friends here, F and T, were curious as to why is the accused person always want to, be, to bring uh, G here and play alone with her in the hut at the rubber plantation. Right? So one day, when the accused person asked G to come and play with him, 
the friends of G that is F and T here basically followed them quietly from behind and were uh, uh, secretly watching them from the holes of the hut and they basically saw that this girl has been raped and of course as I told you earlier this girl didn't know that it was raped yeah so when the incident happened, G now started to feel unwell. So she is now getting depressed and the school, the teacher basically observed her change of behavior. And eventually the, the mother also start to feel something is not right to the girl and inquire what happened. Basically, uh, she told, eventually she told the mother of the fact that she has, uh, this man, accused person here has been doing very odd things to her and the mother knew that it was raped so what happened here is that she was sent to see a doctor where the doctor examined her so first of all the doctor basically inquired from her what actually happened and she basically tells stories as to what this man did to her and the doctor examined her and the examination revealed that she has been raped so now the accused person here is being charged for rape of this girl G. The evidence that you are concerned with here is the evidence of G who is now giving evidence in the court. So the issue here, can she give evidence in the court or not? So you're talking about the witnesses that the prosecutor wish to bring is evidence is G, F and T, which are all child witnesses. So when the issues come into picture, so when the prosecutor wishing to call G, F and T, first of all, the magistrate here has to determine in a preliminary examination whether G, F and T here are competent to testify in the court. Yeah, Whether they are competent to testify in the court. So what happened during preliminary examination, the court has to inquire maybe in an informal way so as not to scare these witnesses, these child witnesses, to see whether they basically understand the questions put to them. Yeah? Whether they can understand the questions put to them and whether they can give rational answers to those questions. Yeah? Whether they can give rational answers to those questions. And when you talk about evidence of a child here, Right, a child here can give two kinds of evidence. The child basically can give sworn evidence and unsworn evidence. Right? Now, if the, uh, the child understands the questions put to them and able to give rational answers to those questions, the child can give a sworn evidence if she understands what is the meaning and implication of an oath. So basically, when you talk about an oath, you are uh, basically taking an oath based on maybe some sacred document. So because if you understand the meaning of an oath, it means that you know the effect of if you, the effect if you lie in court, basically you will be subject to perjury. Now, if you don't understand what is the meaning of an oath, so you have this girl who is 9 and 10 years old, she may have been uh, exposed to the fact that you must not lie in the court, there's a moral obligation that you may not lie in court. So if the child basically understands what does it mean by the duty to tell the truth, so she knows that she must not lie. So as a child, we always embed in children not to tell lies. So basically, she knows there's a duty that she must not lie. If there's a duty to tell the truth, she can give unsworn evidence because she don't know what does it mean by an oath. So if a child does not understand the meaning and implication of an oath, but she understands the duty to tell the truth, she can still give evidence in the court, but the kind of evidence that she'll give is actually an unsworn evidence. If a child able to understand the question, under, able to give rational answers to those questions, and she understand the duty to tell the truth in the sense that she understand what is the implication of an oath, she will be giving a sworn evidence. Right? So this is the situation. So what happened in the court in the case of Sidi bin Ludan is that 
the child understand the questions put to them, the child able to give rational answers to those questions, but because she was 9 and 10 years old, they were 9 and 10 years old, she does not understand what does it mean by an oath, but she understood that there was a duty to tell the truth, and in those cases, in the case of Sidi bin Ludan, and even the case of Tajuddin, what happened was that she was allowed to give sworn evidence. So what happened in the case of Tajuddin is that a proper preliminary examination was conducted and the magistrate found that she, that the children can give unsworn evidence upon understanding the questions put to them and able to give rational answers to those questions. So preliminary examination was conducted in Sidi bin Ludan and the child was allowed to give unsworn evidence in the court. However, in the case of Tajuddin bin Saleh, you have similar facts. You have a man here, an accused person, sexually assaulted a girl behind a library yeah, in school. So what happened here is that the judge, the magistrate in the case of Tajuddin did not conduct any preliminary examination to determine the competency of the child. So this case basically gives you an authority that Upon appeal, because basically there was a conviction by the magistrate, and upon appeal, the, the, uh, the accused person argues that the magistrate did not do any preliminary examination. Therefore, competency of this particular child here was not determined by the magistrate. So, on appeal, the, law ex uh, the, the court uh, uh, held that Failure, to, failure of the magistrate to conduct a preliminary examination in determining competency of this particular child was regarded as miscarriage of justice and cannot be cured under section 422. Right? So you get that? So when you talk about a child giving evidence in the court or a witness giving evidence in the court, you always have to ask two questions. Does the person able to understand the questions put to them? and whether the person can give rational answers to those questions. Yeah? So this is actually to determine the competency of the child. Okay. Now let's look at another uh, uh, provisions relating to competency of a child. We have, sorry, competency of a witness. We have it under section 119 of the Evidence Act, whereby section 119 here is dealing with dumb witnesses. Subsection 1, a witness who is unable to speak may give evidence in any other manner in which he can make it intelligible as, for example, by writing or by signs, but the writing must be written and signs, and the signs must be made in open court. Now, section 919 here is providing you with a dumb witness, a witness who uh, unable to speak due to a physical incapacity. So, the law under section 190 says that even a dumb witness are competent witness to testify. So, the way he testify or he or she testify will be by way of writing it in a piece of paper. It can also be by sign language and this has to be done in an open court. Right? So, the case of Chako against public prosecutor here, basically... Talking about a dumb witnesses and a dumb witness here can testify in the court as long as you can ask the question positively what is addressed under section 118. So you have a dumb witness here who are able to understand the questions put to them uh, and are able to give rational answers to those questions, then this particular dumb witness can also testify in the court. Alright? So that is actually under section 119. 190 relating to dumb witnesses. Another uh, provision that talks about competency is basically section 120, subsection 1 and 2 and 3 of the Evidence Act. Now let's look at section 120 here. So this provision also is a special provision providing for spouse witnesses, competency of a spouse to give evidence in the court. Now, let's look at section 120. Yeah, 120 relating to spouse witnesses. Yeah, subsection 1 in a civil proceeding, the parties to the suit 
and the husband or wife of any party to the suit shall be a competent shall be competent witness subsection 2 in criminal proceeding against any person the husband or wife of that person respectively shall be a competent witness so under section 120 subsection 1 and subsection 2 provides that if you have a husband and wife right so you have So under section 120, you are talking about spouse witnesses you have in civil proceeding, you also have it in criminal proceeding. So if you have a third party here is suing the husband, the wife can be competent witness to give evidence in the court against or in favour of the husband in a civil proceeding. So the wife is basically competent witness to testify. And in a civil proceeding between husband and the wife, they are competent witness against each other. Now, what does it mean? For example, you have a civil case between husband and wife, the matters relating to the custody of a child. So the wife and husband here can give evidence against each other in the civil proceedings. So because they are competent to give evidence against each other. So that is actually what happened in civil proceeding. In criminal proceeding, if you look at section 120, subsection 2, in criminal proceedings against any person, the husband or wife of that person respectively shall be a competent witness. So it means that if you have a criminal proceedings against a third party, so you have a third party here, maybe on behalf, so you have the prosecutor here, you have a third party here being, being uh, 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 the one that is unrelated to the husband and wife so you have the accused person who is the husband right a witness here can give evidence in the court against the husband for an action taken by a third party or you may have the husband here so you have it's the husband and wife here so you have the wife here maybe yeah true prosecutor is seeking action against the husband in criminal cases maybe you have a domestic violent case the wife here can give evidence against the husband. So it means that husband and wife, they are competent to give evidence against each other in either third party proceedings against them or in their proceedings against, against each other in both civil and criminal proceedings. So they are basically competent witness. They can testify. Remember, as long as you satisfy the test in Tajuddin, you are able to understand the question put to you, you are able to give rational answers to those questions. Right? So, when you're talking about evidence of a wife here, a spouse can give evidence in the, in the court. However, when we talk about the competency of a spouse to give evidence in the court, the evidence given by the husband or the wife under section 120 here is subject to the provision under section 122. Section 120 here, 122 here is provide for the compatibility of the spouse to give evidence in the court. Right? Now let's look at section, yeah, look at the provision here. Basically, Issues of compatibility of a spouse to give evidence in the court is governed by section 122 of the Evidence Act. Now let's cross refer to section 122. Now this one is applicable only in criminal cases. Sorry, uh, it can be applicable yeah, in criminal cases. Now let's look at section 122, communication during marriage. No person who is or has been married shall be compelled to disclose any communication made to him during marriage by any person to whom he is or has been married or shall be permitted to disclose any such communication unless the person who made it, for, who made it or his representative in interest consents except in suit between married persons or proceedings which in which other married person is prosecuted for any crime committed against the other. Now it means that section 122 here is providing you with the law relating to compatibility of a witness. 
a spouse can be competent to testify in the court they can give they can be a witness against the spouse against the husband or the wife however section 122 basically says that a spouse cannot be compelled to disclose any communication so under section 122 here evidence of the spouse here is subject to privilege Right? The, the evidence of the spouse here is subject to privilege in the sense that the wife cannot be compelled to testify in the court relating to whatever communication that they may have during marriage. Now, why is this so? So, it means that if you have a situation, so if you have a situation of a husband and wife here, so you have here a situation where the husband here is committing a crime, against v so the prosecutor here is taking action against the husband for committing a crime so perhaps under uh, assault so the witness here is w the wife is the witness here the wife is a competent witness to testify in the court under section 120 however the wife may not be compelled to give evidence in the court as to what transpired between them so whatever communication that they may have, the wife here may not may, cannot be compelled to testify in the court. She may refuse to say what the husband said to her. So that is what it meant by compellability. Right? So the wife is basically cannot be compelled to testify with regards to any communication made during marriage. Right? Now, why is this law like this? Why is the law according this special position on the spouse from giving evidence in the court, right? This special provision here is say is basically has a rationale to promote peace in a family relationship. There is a feeling of mutual confidence where the aim is actually to keep intact the relationship between the husband and the wife. So that is the the rationale is basically based on public policy. So you do not want the relationship between husband and wife to collapse. So to keep intact the relationship between husband and wife, whatever communication that they may have between each other are supposed to be privileged. They are, the wife or husband cannot be forced to say, uh, to disclose whatever they say in the court. So that is actually the rationale as to why this privileged communication is provided for to the wife or the husband. Oh, I mean to the spouse, yeah? Basically, that is the position. Now, when you look at section 122 back here, okay? Now, under section 120, just now we say that husband and wife are competent witness. They can testify against each other. However, 100, section 122 says that the husband and, the husband and wife here cannot be compelled you cannot be compelled to discuss any communication made to him during marriage and basically what are the elements that you have to prove for the privilege or for the uh, for the yeah for the privilege to be accorded to the spouse right so let's look at the elements of section 122 which provides you with the protection which allow for the child for the wife to uh, obtain the privilege so number 1 the communication must be made during marriage. Yeah, the communication must be made during marriage. Now, we have to... Okay, that will be number one. Number two, uh, let's look at the provision here of the Evidence Act. The privilege can, o can only be accorded to the spouse if he is referring to the communication made to them. Yeah, made communication made to the spouse who is actually the witness so number one the communication has to be made during marriage and number two the privilege can only be accorded if it is a communication made by the spouse to the witness spouse so you have that situation and the third one will be the privilege will remain yeah, the privilege will remain even after the death of the parties 
or even after the parties have been divorced. So, the communication, whatever transpired during marriage here, will stay even though after one has died or even after they have been divorced. So, that is the, the situation. Now, let's look at uh, these elements one by one. Right? So, you have here section 122. Number one, you're talking about the communication has to be during marriage. So, the first element that you've got to do here is, what does it mean by the communication? Because section 122 seems to emphasize that, no person shall be compelled to disclose any communication made to him during marriage. Now, when you talk about communication, communication here is referring to the spoken words. You are talking about the spoken words or written words. Spoken words. Sorry. I kept talking about the spoken words. You are talking about, say for example, you have a situation here. A assaulted V. A went home and saw the wife. So the wife basically look at the condition of the husband, suspect something is not right. So the wife inquired from the husband, what happened to you? So A said that I have been violent on V. I have assaulted him. Not only that, I gave him a big, uh, I use, have used some kind of weapon and assaulted V. So A here is making a statement to the wife as to what happened on that particular day where he attacked V. So here... For it to fall, for the privilege, now now what happened here is that the wife here is called as a witness to testify in the court. You have the prosecution here taking an action for uh, A, att uh, attacking the victim here. So the prosecutor wished to call the wife as a prosecution witness. Privilege under section 122 is that the wife cannot testify in the court as to what A said to him. So when you talk about communication here, you are talking about the spoken word. So the husband here may say to the wife that I have basically used some kind of weapon to attack V. That particular statement is actually privileged under section 122 because it refers to the spoken words. Yeah. Now as a general rule, as a general rule, you are talking about the spoken words. So it means that action is not privilege. So if the wife saw the husband coming home with blood on the hand and saw him going to the bathroom and wash the hands, right? So, so the observation made by the wife here basically does not fall under communication, right? Because section 122 only refers to the communication made by the accused person husband to the wife. So, if the wife observe, right, the conduct of the husband, the action of the husband coming back home with the hands uh, contain stains of blood and wash it, the observation of the wife here does not reflect communication under section 122 of the Evidence Act. So, it has to refer to the spoken word. Actions are not communication in terms of words, yeah? Right. However, the case of Paltas Aramugam, right? Now, what happened in this case is that, so the offense is actually possession of firearm. The wife basically, basically saw the husband holding the firearm, right? So when the husband came home, there has been communication and actions between the husband and the wife. So what happened here is that while the husband making an explanation, he also has uh, uh, accompanied that with the action. So in that case, the court says that spoken word plus action can be regarded as communication. It means that, right? It means that if the act is so intrinsically interwoven with the communication that it's impossible for you to separate between the action and communication, 
then the action plus communication will be regarded as communication under section 122. Okay? So what you have here, I gave you an example just now. A has assaulted V, being a, a attacked V. The wife came home, the husband saw the husband's hand stains with blood. And while the husband was actually, so the husband here is explaining the wife as to the attack. So the husband basically making an explanation not only by spoken word, but also with actions. Right? So he is basically showing an action as to how he attacked. So you have here the statement made by the husband here to the wife is interwoven in the sense that the action plus word are so inextricably interwoven that it cannot be separated because the husband was telling stories, it is added up with his action. So in that case, the court says that this is a privileged communication. So this is communication under section 122. So if the court, the wife here, give evidence in the court and if the prosecutor asks her what happened on that particular day and if she refused to testify what the husband said and even refused to testify what he saw, what she saw, that is still privileged under section 122. She cannot be compelled to testify in the court because of the interwoven nature of the spoken words and the action. So that is what the case of Paldas is stating. Okay? So that will be the first element of section 122. So number two, the second element of section 122 is that the communication here is, must refer to the communication of the spouse to the, to the witness. So this is the spouse witness. So you have the communication has to the communication made by the spouse, per accused person who is the spouse, to the spouse witness. So you have here a situation where A here, right? So you have here, A is now being charged for assaulting V. And A here is making a statement to the wife, right? A here is making a statement to the wife. So A is telling the stories as to what transpired, as to how he attacked the person. So the wife also made some comments responding to the statement made by the accused person, say, at home. So when the husband tell the stories to her as to what transpired, so the wife responded to him. The response made by the wife here is not communication under section 122. So statement, a communication must be referring to a statement made by the accused person to the wife not the wife to the person. It is a one-way communication. So if the communication that is made by the wife to the accused person, that is not privileged communication under section 122. So it must refer to whatever A said to the wife and not wife said to A. Yeah, that is what it meant to, uh, it is what is meant by communication under section 122. All right, so that is the second Second uh, 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 element that you can find under section 20, 122. And the third one is that the privilege of the communication of the wife to the spouse, to the, to the witness, is actually privileged even after the death of parties or even after the divorce. So you have the third here. Yeah, the third uh, element here in, in which you have under section 122 here, the privilege referred to the communication made during marriage and will remain even after the party has, is dead or even after they have been divorced. So if you have a situation where so you have here A is assaulting B, right? And the uh, A is making a statement to the wife. So the wife here is actually called by the prosecution to give evidence for the prosecutor. This incident transpired maybe in 2017. The trial has just arrived. So because of the delay, the trial is actually in 2020. Now the wife is no longer this particular person, the prosecution witness near who is the wife, was no longer the wife of the accused person. 
Now, can she testify when she is divorced from the accused person? The law says that the privilege accorded to the husband here, the wife cannot disclose whatever communication that they made, that he made to the girl, to the wife, even though after they divorce. Now, on this note, we have to ask a question. When will the privilege begin? Yeah, when will the privilege begin? When will the husband here accord the privilege where the wife's communication, the statement made to the wife here, is not cannot be tendered as evidence in the court? So when will it begin? Now, privilege begin from the date of the marriage. So privilege begin from the date of the marriage. That is from the acquisition of the status of husband and wife. Now, when we talk about this, we are not talking about the common law husband and wife. We are talking about uh, the situation where the marriage has to be registered. So, it is a registered marriage. So, the privilege, the privilege begins when they register their marriage to the relevant authority. Now, you have basically the case of, for, for this information, you have the case of Gauss, again, Kadir Mastan. What happened in this case is that you have a child who is 16 years old who has been kidnapped by the accused person. So he, the, the accused person, basically perhaps the boyfriend of the girl here, right, who is a 10-year-old girl. He kidnapped her and later he married her, right? So now complaint has been made and he is now being charged for kidnapping, right? So during trial for kidnapping here, the prosecution is wishing to call the girl who is now the wife of the accused person to give evidence in the court. Now the evidence that is sought by the prosecution is related to the incident of kidnapping which happens before they were married. Now in this case, the court says that the communication made by the girl here between them basically is not privileged under section was not privileged under section 122 because they were not yet married when the kidnapping took place so the law says that privilege can only happen after the relationship between them has been formalized by marriage All right so that is the case of gauss against kade sorry gauss uh, ben kade mastan against uh, the, uh, the the crown so this happened in 1946 yeah the case of Vergis Vergis which, which is a common law case this is an Indian case so the status can only be accorded the shield can only be protected the communication will only be privileged only after the status of the husband and wife been confirmed so there has to be uh, it has to be upon registration of their marriage. So that will be one issue. That is the, uh, the when will the privilege accorded. Now number two, so that will be number one. Number two will be, when will be the privilege lost? Yeah, when will be the privilege lost or last? Basically what happened here is that, okay, you have this in the case of Ibrahim Awang Mal. The court says that the privilege will continue even after termination of marriage. So you have this in the case of Nawab Paulander. You also have this in the case of Ibrahim Awang. So it means that even after the wife and husband has been divorced, the communication made to them will remain to be privileged so if the incident of assault or incident of crime happened when they were subsistingly still in marriage, so whatever transpired between them, especially the communication made by the accused person to the wife, will be protected by privilege under section 122. Right? So that is the position under section 122. Right? So uh, it has to be number one. Just now we discussed. We discussed section uh, 100, uh, number 22. There must be communication. Communication can, can be inclusive of actions because if they are interwovenly together, yeah, uh, 
actions plus communication are so interwoven together you cannot separate it then action plus communication can be regarded as communication under section 122 and number two you're referring to the communication made by the accused person to the witness spouse witness and number three the communication must happen during marriage now let's look at section 122 again now there is an exception there so except in suit between married persons or proceedings of in which other married person is prosecuted for any crime committed against each other now basically you have under section 122 here communication between husband and wife are supposed to be privileged yeah and the wife can give evidence the wife cannot be compelled to give evidence relating to whatever the husband said to him in the court except when they are having a suit against each other so you have a situation here where the wife have been assaulted by the husband so this is a domestic violent case so the wife make a complaint to the uh, to the police and an action for domestic violence was taken by the prosecutor uh, uh, against the husband so the wife here is going to be a witness in this situation now in this situation if you refer to the exception to section 122 here the communication made by the the husband to the wife is not privileged yeah it's no longer privileged because you are talking about the action against each other all right okay how uh, having said that there will be instances where the privilege between the, the husband and wife be waived so section 122 provides you with a situation where you cannot rely on section 122 just now what i discussed with you will be the situation where you can rely on the privileged communication but this will be instances where the the privilege under section 122 will not be relied on that is when there is no legal marriage so you have a common law husband and wife situation common law husband and wife you are staying together uh, with that particular person then you are not to be regarded as legally married privilege will not going to be accorded in this situation number two they will not going to be privileged where the spouse give consent when you talk about consent here it has to be a positive or express consent given by the spouse right to disclose the communication right there must be a positive consent or express consent given by the spouse to disclose the communication this one you have this in the case of gimbu singkali yeah, in 1956. Now, what happened here is that the accused person has been charged for the murder of the father-in-law. Eh? And the wife here was asked to give evidence in the court, but the wife refused and claimed privilege. And here, of course, the general rule here, the court is not, uh, sorry, the wife is not compelled to give evidence in the court because it is protected for by privilege. But the court proceed on to say that if the husband here is giving um, okay this is a situation sorry this is a situation where you are talking about a criminal case so this is uh, okay sorry i made an error here so this is where we are talking about the last part where the evidence of the spouse here cannot be used uh, on privilege because you're talking about criminal cases right uh, so we just uh, take it out a little bit here basically when we talk about um, spouse can give evidence in the court privilege is not accorded to this particular spouse if the spouse give positive consent for any communication made to him during marriage so basically you have a situation where the spouse consented to the to the wife disclosing the information right the third situation in which uh, can, there can be a waiver is where you have a situation where evidence, okay, where you have, you're talking about criminal prosecution. 
if you talk about criminal prosecution, basically, a wife here, the spouse here, can give evidence in the court in criminal prosecution. This is provided for in the case of PP against Abdul Majid. Yeah, PP against Abdul Majid. Now, what happened here is that the law will not going to allow protection given by the accused person. So, if so the wife can basically give evidence in the court as to what she perceived. The only protection that is accorded by the court will be the communication made by the husband to the wife. So the, uh, it means that in criminal cases, wife can give evidence in the court against the husband. But of course, it will still be subject to privileged communication under section 122 just now. That is very limited to the communication made by the husband to the wife. You have this in the case of PP against Abdul Majid. You also have this in the case of Gimbu and Singkaling. Right? Singkaling, this is a 1956 case. As I told you just now, this is a case where the accused person here killed uh, the father-in-law. And during trial, the court, the prosecutor wished to call the, the wife to give evidence. And the wife basically... Uh, is trying to use privilege communication under section 122. Now, what happened in this case is that the court says that the wife, the privilege is only accorded to the communication made by the husband to her as far as the evidence that she saw, she perceived, this is not subject to privilege. So, she can be compelled to testify in the court as to what she saw of the fact that maybe she saw the husband was uh, covering with blood and whatnot, so that is an evidence that can be tendered. So, in criminal prosecution, basically, a wife can give evidence against the husband. The only protection is that the one provided for by uh, the provision under section 122 that is communication made during marriage. All right, so this will be what we have discussed just now. So, we look at uh, evidence relating to spouse. The wife can testify, the spouse can give evidence against the husband. The age is accorded with privilege. So these are the elements of privilege that we have discussed. So basically, situation where it can be waived. Just now, we have discussed about a few situations where the privilege can be waived. Alright? So this one will end the discussion on a spouse witness. We will continue in the next lecture on competency of an accused person giving evidence in his own behalf.